Hello, um, welcome to the Master of the Wind Let's Play. Um, so, this is how it's going to work. Um, I did this for Clean Slate a while back. Uh, you can find it on my channel if you want to watch it. And if you're a fan of this game and you haven't seen the Clean Slate one, I actually recommend you watch that one first. Um, just because, you know, this is technically the sequel to that game and it would, uh, you know, you'd get a new perspective on some of the stuff that happened, so I think that might be kind of cool. Um, but hey, it's up to you. If you want to watch this one, I'm not stopping you. Um, so, yeah, this is, uh, this is Master of the Wind. This is the most popular thing that I've ever made, for sure. Um, and we're going to try and do this maybe once a week. You know, when I was doing, uh, Clean Slate, I was doing it every day, but, uh, those days are gone. <laughs> um, so once a week. Maybe twice if I get lucky. And so we've got the intro here. Um, which has changed only a little bit since the uh, you know the very first version that we put out back in 2005. Um, you know, we made the map a little prettier and changed some dialogue to make it more consistent with the characters. You know, for example, um, Stoic had like a made a made some kind of pun about being soaked to the bone in the first scene and but you know much later we established that he he hates puns so that was you know didn't really make any sense so we changed it um and then he, they're about to go into this room here with the fairy and the bed and all that it introduces the whole fairy mechanic this we added later as well um both to introduce the fairy thing but also um the next map, you know, the Fort Drake map with the, the holes in the ground, um, is very bare by design. You know, pretty much has to be for that puzzle to work. But it wasn't necessarily the best, like, way to kick off things off visually. So um, Art Bane thought that, uh, you know, we should have another room before that. Or, um, you know, his, his name is Mark. We're probably going to be calling him Mark at some point. So if you hear that, that's what I'm talking about. Um, and then we have the the music from Castlevania, which it's it's so weird and like not what you expect from you know a sort of classical RPG, and uh, but it, in a lot of ways it, it sets the tone for um, for the game right away. Man, I haven't played this in a while. <laughs> so I guess what I wanted to do in this first one, just because you know we're going to be spending a lot of time wandering around, falling in holes, and looking for treasure for a while. There's only so much you can say about that. I just wanted to talk about things that have happened since we finished this game. Because I think, you know, a lot of the fan base kind of went their own way, and, you know, the whole um, indie game maker thing is much different. I mean, when we, when we started this game, we had no, like... No, no thought that it would, you know, that we'd sell it or anything. That was just not even like on the radar. Not a thing that happened. Um, but by the time it was over, that that was just starting to to get really big. Um, and of course, this game we can never sell because it's got commercial music and all that. And in fact, I might even have to upload the video twice in case uh, you know YouTube gives me any shit about the, the music. Um, you never really know which song is gonna trigger that. So. But by the time you see it, I'll have um, I'll have the music worked out, and if you hear something unfamiliar, it's probably because I had to replace it to um, you know to get the audio through. So, but anyway, since this game ended, um, we talked about doing a commercial project, um, and we started this game X Noir, which is uh, kind of like a detective game, and it's and it's it's a weird game. It w it was hard to it's kind of a hard sell. It's still a hard sell. Um, and for a while we thought it was going to be commercial, but once we got, you know, some of the first, uh, sections of it done, we kind of realized that we didn't really have the resources to bring it up to the, uh, you know, the, the level of polish that you would have wanted for, you know, a commercial release. Um, in fact, that was the, you know, that's the main knock in the game is that it's, you know, it's fairly dark subject matter, but, you know, it's main to VX, VX Ace. And all the uh, all the sprites are all cute and cuddly, and you know I understand that. You know I really do, but like 
it was the only option at the time, you know, we didn't really, there wasn't anybody who was going to be like making a bunch of, you know, better looking sprites, that game had a big cast, so it just would have been hard, um, and, you know, even though that's, that's a worthwhile point to make, what I didn't like about that was that it was basically saying that, you know, if your visuals can't sync well with the subject matter, you just shouldn't make anything, even if it's for a hobby. And that kind of attitude bugs me, because I think people should just make stuff, and if it's flawed, you know, it's flawed. But, uh, you know, you shouldn't be afraid to, to put a story out there, just because, you know, you don't quite have the resources to, to make it as good as it could be, or make it look as good as it could be, anyway. Um, so that was sort of touch and go for two and a half years or so. We did eventually finish it. It's on uh, RPGMaker.net, if you want to check it out. Um, and then, of course, there was Labyrinth and Dreams, which was the Kickstarter project. And that one was commercial. It did eventually get on Steam, and it's still there. Um, and that was, was a very educational experience in a lot of ways. Um, you know, we made the, the meat of that game, the story and the gameplay. Uh, Mark and I put that together in, like, a month. <laughs> it was just came along at the right time, you know. I, I was on, I was on paternity leave. Um, I don't think he was employed at the time, and so we just uh, we had the time to, to really like put a lot of effort into it um, and just get like a prototype done and just you know the everything before my kids being born was so emotional that I was totally ready to, to put something you know like, something like that out there. Um, all those feelings were just below the surface. So we did that, but the funny thing is, you know, the the core of the game got made so quickly, but it was another like it was another year. It was more than that um, before it actually, you know, was ready <laughs> to go out. Um, you know, we did the Kickstarter, which was successful. I mean, it, it was mostly funded by our friends and family. There were very few uh, strangers chipping in. Um, so, you know, we got lucky in that respect. You know, I'm not a, I'm not really a self promoter. You know, I try sometimes, but it doesn't come naturally, and I think people can tell that. So it's that's that makes it kind of hard. Um, but it worked out, and we did the game. We had artists come in and you know make new sprites and new backgrounds and just really tune it up visually and it look it looks really good I think. I mean it's obviously the best looking game that I've ever worked on. Um, and as for its release, well I have a lot of different feelings about it really. I, w I wouldn't call it a failure. Um, it certainly didn't sell a whole lot, you know, right right away when it came out. But um, since then there's been you know, Steam sales, Humble Bundles, stuff like that, and uh, that brought in a lot of people. Um, you know, at this point, like, two years later, uh, a lot of people bought it. You know, we got a lot of reviews, most of them are good. Um, and, uh, you know, I personally made enough to <laughs> to buy an, an Xbox One and some games for myself, so I guess that's enough to say it was successful enough. Um, you know, we split everything with Steam and with Dejica, who published it, so after that, you know, you have to sell a lot of copies before, you know, me and Mark saw any, like, serious money, but, you know, just the same. It was a good experience, and it sort of taught a lot about, like, what goes into a real commercial game, just the amount of time it took to make that hour of gameplay, you know, suitable for, um, you know, for a commercial release was, was instructive. Just the time, the effort, the money. It's uh, really something. It's not something to take lightly, that's for sure. And so not long after Labyrinth of Dreams came out, there was the first indie game maker contest. Um, I was a judge the second year. But the first year, we entered. Um, and we made World Remade, which was another Solace game. The first one we had done since this game. And... Uh, you know, we brought back some of our collaborators from uh, from Labyrinth and Dreams, and it uh, it came out pretty well. I mean, we didn't win the contest. There's some really good games that came out of there, but um, it came out good. And and we for a while we thought about you know keeping it going, but and then we made some more stuff. But it was pretty clear that like 
the amount of resources it was going to take to make a, a game with that kind of large scale to make it, you know, consistently meet that um, high standard we had set with the first one, the first uh, installment that was entered into the contest was going to be, the amount of resources was going to be huge. And uh, Labyrinth and Dreams was definitely not pulling in enough to, to pay for all that. So, you know, we sort of just let it go by the wayside. And also, I mean, unfortunately, it didn't seem like too many people played it were all that into it. Um, you know, I got critiqued a lot for being, like, kind of dry and slow-paced and whatever, but, you know, there's no Finley around to make everybody laugh. Um, so, yeah, that wasn't <laughs> the most encouraging thing in the world. But it's too bad, you know, because of all my um, unfinished work, the unfinished stories that I have lying around, I actually think that one probably has the most potential. Just some of the ideas I had for it, I was really excited about. And, um, you know, maybe it'll uh, it'll surface at some point in the future. Um, maybe not. You know, I don't know. And so I think that mostly catches us up with the present. Uh, at the moment, I'm working on a... Uh, a book. I wrote another book during Master of the Wind. It was called The World Beyond, and it was about like reality television in the future and uh, you know, sort of wacky stuff. A lot of stuff that had been kicking around in my head for a long time. Um, the one I'm doing now is about um, ghosts. Not like horror ghosts, though. It's like a, you know, the paranormal investigation of a, a, a teenage kid who killed himself and just trying to figure out, communicate from the grave and just figure out like what was going on with him. Um, it's, it's, you know, people who have followed my work, I think it'll be familiar in some ways and, uh, not so familiar in others. So I'd like to finish that. A lot of it's written. And once that's, uh, once that's done, I want to go back to a project I started that was called Legacy. Some of you might have heard of it. I talked about it for a lot. <laughs> I've been sort of brainstorming about this game for, God, like five or six years. Um... And it's basically a more uh, open-ended take on, on this sort of uh, this sort of game. It'd be in the Celeste world, but you sort of choose what magic you use. You choose a weapon you use, and there's a lot of like wandering. It's kind of like my tribute to the old Might and Magic games, but with a um, you know a more detailed story than than those games uh, tend to have. So I'd like to get back to that. I got a lot of the scripts lined up back in the day that I would need, which is good because now I have them. Um, so we'll, uh, I'll have to re-familiarize myself with that and then, uh, you know, see what happens from there. Um, all right. So thanks for indulging me. I just wanted to sort of tell people what, what everything that had happened since this game was done. Um, so right now here we have our first com uh, confrontation with Andau. Um, who was named after Martin Landau, the actor who once played the actor Bella Lugosi in the movie Ed Wood, and of course Bella Lugosi played Dracula. You know the most famous Dracula. He says, "Children of the night, what the music they make." You know that's that's Bella Lugosi. Um, so you know a little convoluted origin for his name. Uh, and this is you know. At this point, this is very, this is highly like cheese comic book dialogue, um, you know, which is what I was going for, of course. But uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily jive with the majority of the game. The game gets much more serious, but uh, the initial idea was something like a comic book. Um, in fact, I was, you know, I was entertaining the idea of not even having a overarching story at all of just being this sort of episodic thing with uh, you know Shroud and Stoic going on different adventures fighting different villains um, but it sort of uh, turned into a more traditional RPG for, for better or worse um, I mean I still think that there's you know commentary on the whole superhero idea throughout but uh, it's not as obvious and this is playing it fairly straight, this stuff at the beginning. Um, and, uh, but one thing that, that, that did work pretty well, and that people 
tend tended to compliment was just that we started the game with the dungeon like right away. Um, you know, there was like there's like that 15 second cutscene, and then you're you're in the first dungeon, which um, you know I think people appreciated because this you know there's that cliche of just having a lot of text on a blank screen and telling you about the world, but you don't care about it yet, so you're just kind of like bored waiting for it to stop. Um, so we sort of like cut around that. We just figured. Let's just throw them right in the in the superhero action, and then establish you know their civilian lives afterwards, which is what we're about to do. Um, yeah, so we're in the armor shop, and this map was actually the first map that I ever made in RPG Maker XP. Uh, Mark did all the Fort Drake stuff, and. This, um, it didn't look anything like this though. <laughs> it used to be massive. It used to take up the entire screen. There was no, like, you know, interior tile barrier, or whatever you want to call that, um, which is generally considered the, uh, the proper way to, to make indoor rooms. Um, so yeah, if you think, you know, the mapping's not good now, you should have seen it before. Oof. Um, so at some point during one of the, uh, the upgrades of the old stuff, we, um, we sort of tightened up the maps, made it you know more efficient looking, better use of space, and that means that all the movement in this cutscene, people coming in and out, because there's a lot, I had to uh, redo it all. Um, but it was worth it. You know, it looks a lot better. Uh, and the outside of Port Ariana also looks much better. That was <laughs> that was really not a, a terribly impressive map uh, back then. Hey, look, it's everybody's favorite. It's Finley. Hey, Finley. Well, he's a douche at this point in the game. He's just a rich little twat. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, you grow to love him. You do. Um, so, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, so then we had somebody come in and, and do Port Area on over again. It was actually, uh, it was Raven the Dark Angel, if you know who that is. She was uh, sort of active in the RPG Maker community back in the day. If she ever happens to watch this, hi. Uh, hope you're having a good time <laughs> over in Germany. Um, she used to live near me, and she actually uh, was living in my house for a few weeks while she was kind of preparing to, to move to Germany. Although she had done the, the new maps for Port Ariana before that. But, you know, good friend of ours. Um, and it looks great. She also did Harold uh, much later, and that looks awesome, too. She just uh, had a knack for mapping and visuals and stuff like that. Um... So, very little of this is actually, you know, from the original. Like, this, um, a lot of the dialogue got changed. It used to be pretty mature. I mean, I guess it still might have some immature elements, but, uh, there was a lot more, like, kind of goofiness. Like, I think Stoic called somebody a tool at some point. Um, threatened to kick somebody in the nuts, you know, stuff like that. And once we sort of had the a better idea of how the characters speak. Um, went back and, and tuned some of this up. The stuff with Emma in particular, uh, the blonde chick that just walked in and out, um, was, yeah, you know, it was, it, I wasn't conveying what I was hoping to convey about the characters. Um, I always assumed that Saad, um, that's how you say his name, by the way, <laughs> Saad, people like to say Cade, but it's Saad as in facade, which means a mask, um, or a disguise. But I always got the impression that uh, Saad um, sort of pursued her, not because he was, you know, terribly, like, attracted to her or interested in her, but because he just felt like he should have have a woman. You know, he just, and so he picked one that he thought was, you know, cute enough and sort of pursued her. And, um, and I think, just you know, if you're, it's kind of a young, you know. It, it's it's a it demonstrates that he's a young man because when you're growing up, if you're a guy, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of pressure to be promiscuous, for lack of a better word. You're supposed to be just like racking up a list of girls that you nailed and not you know caring about them too much. It's it's fucked up. I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, girls have it worse. They're always you know every girl born after 1970 thinks they're fat. I mean, that's just been my experience, even if they're like fucking scrawny and can blow away with a gust of wind they think they're fat and uh but you know there's fucked up stuff with like guys growing up too 
you know and that's one of it just this idea that like you have to be like this you know conqueror in in matters of romance all right so now we're outside port ariana and from what i've heard in other let's plays of this game there's been a couple others this song has caused trouble um i guess the youtube copyright goons are especially um attuned to it and so they uh you know they take it down so you it's possible that you may be hearing a totally different song than you used to you know i don't know for sure until i put it up and then if i do put it up i'm gonna have to get this footage again with the um different music i'll have to put different music in the game uh that's what that's what pip had to do pip did has done the, the longest let's play so far of this and uh, that's what yeah that's what happened there um so i'm gonna have to keep my commentary very general because uh there's no guarantee that you know when i do the footage again that i'm gonna go into every building um you know in the exact same order or like with the or take the exact same amount of steps or whatever so I wouldn't want to be commenting on something that, uh, you know, wasn't jiving with what's on the screen. So I'm going to have to just stick to general commentary about the game as a whole until we get to some of the stuff uh, nailed down. Um, and once I have an understanding of which songs I'll be able to get through uh, the copyright crap and which ones I can't, um, that'll make it easier to get really, like, uh, dive deep into specifics. Um, and we will have a chance to dive deep because these are going to be longer episodes. When I was doing the clean slate stuff, I was sticking to about 15 minutes an episode. Um, but since I'm doing this one less often, because I got kids now, and, uh, it's a rare occasion where it's quiet in the house. It's so, but I do, uh, there'll be longer episodes, so you get a little more bang for your click. Um, so we'll have about a half hour each, maybe a little less, depending on, a little more, just depending on, you know, where a good stopping point is. Um, and we're going to need, <laughs> we're going to need big episodes, because this game's long as hell. I think the, the Clean Slate Let's Play was like, I don't know, 16 hours or something like that, just to, but I was, I had leveled myself up to the maximum just so I could get through the, the battles, because the battles, you know, are a lot worse in this game, this game's battles are much better. Um, so I'll be playing this one more like a real game, you know, less grindy. <laughs> so when you're walking around this town here, um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, world building that you get by talking to the NPCs, some subtle, some not particularly subtle, but, um, what I like is that, uh, you know, the goblins and the skeletons and, and Lodites are walking around, and it just sort of... And it's treated as totally normal, so it, it tells you right away that, okay, this is this is a place where, you know, not just humans are um, are settled. You know, it's, uh, it's where, you know, lots of different kinds of creatures roam. <laughs> so, because, you know, this is... This is after... Um, the fall of the Galleon Empire, which you can learn all about if you don't know much Clean Slate. And um, earlier, uh, Saad referred to Gallia as a huge political mess. I'm hoping that if I do uh, do Legacy, I'll be able to um, to what do you call it to explore that huge political mess a little bit. Because Gallia is talked about a lot in this game, but the actual city is glimpsed only uh, briefly. So, um, a lot of this game is kind of about what it takes to hold on to progress. Um, whereas Clean Slate was a very straightforward, like, you know, overthrowing the oppressive regime kind of story. In this game, you know, the, the sort of the good guys have won, more or less. Um, you know, and everybody tells me this game's too black and white, but I mean, come on. You know, prejudice is bad. I think we can all agree on that. Um, and, but it's not necessarily just over after that, you know, because the elements that, you know, give rise to that kind of stuff 
don't go away. I mean, they become a minority, but they, they don't go away. And so you just sort of have, you have to stay vigilant and, um, you know, try not to slide back on, on progress. And there's, there's a lot of that in this game where, I, you know, Saad's grown up in a world without the Galleon Empire. And, um, Bones, you know, is old enough to remember what it was like before that. Um, so it's just that, you know, that difference in perspective is a pretty key point when it comes to the, the differences between them. So at some point, maybe I've done it, maybe I haven't, because once again, I don't know if this is the exact footage that's going to get on YouTube. Um, I got the key and went into that little shed on the docks, and that's a weird little <laughs> gag in this game. Um, these two weird NPCs that my brother made. Now, my younger brother has a long tradition of making bizarre NPCs. Um, they're usually pretty funny though, but those two, the, um, the baby and the clown, although the clown will show up a lot later in this game, it's just a running gag, were just a little too deranged, <laughs> so we, uh, we didn't want to totally get rid of them because they made us laugh, but at the same time, you know, just having them walk around town was too, too weird, so we, uh, came to the odd compromise of throwing them in that shed and making the um, the key like a little objective that you could do. Um, so that's that. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to wrap this up soon because um, once you go see Gino, a lot of stuff happens. Um, so we'll save that for the next one. But uh, I hope you guys enjoy this. Um, you know, I didn't want to do it like right after the game was done. I thought it was still too... Uh, I just kind of want to let it breathe a little bit, let it stand on its own, but, um, you know, it's been five years since the game was finished, and I think it's a good time to kind of look back on it. Um, and actually, part of the reason I wanted to do it now was because it's a presidential election. And I think the Clean Slate one benefited a lot from being done during a presidential election in um, 2012. Of course, this one's a lot wackier than 2012, so who, who knows <laughs> what we're going to find um, that will seem resonant now. But uh, I think that's enough for now, so uh, hope you keep watching. See you next time.